And William built a reputation quite quickly as to being a reliable observer. And his burgeoning friendships with the um, leading astronomers of the day helped to increase his knowledge. And in the background, doing all the work, was Caroline. Because he was outside calling out the numbers um, and the distances and whatever else he had to do. And she was, uh, because, and he didn't want to change his dark adapted eye, so she was on the sides taking down the numbers. And in the morning, she set about doing the sums. And keeping and keeping the catalogue up to date. So oh, here's this is the, there's the um, scullery where the molten um, metal went all over the floor. This is probably the kitchen, and at the back probably the storeroom. It's been quite nicely restored this museum. Telescope, that's what it says here, and that's what we've got there, so we're doing fine. <laughs> but sadly, little Caroline was not with William on the night of the 13th of March, 1781. He himself was busy on that night with his systematic review of the entire visible sky of the Northern Hemisphere with the object of finding um, pairs of stars to help with the calculation of stellar distances. He was sweeping horizontally, not vertically. Um, and uh, because his instrument was of such high quality and he made it himself, uh, he immediately recognized this new star as um, a, 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 a recognized difference in this new star. And within a matter of hours, he had become the first human being to set eyes on the planet Uranus. And I do want it clear that it's pronounced Uranus. <laughs> Get a lot of nasty jokes about that. <laughs> William was quite laid back about this momentous discovery, and he reported his findings to the Royal Society, and there was disbelief until it was pointed out that the homemade telescope had extraordinarily high magnification. Those are his notes on the finding of Uranus. And this is a picture which NASA sent to me after the Voyager uh, probe in, when was that, 1986, 1987? So he wasn't, you know, the notes he was taking were not exactly copious, were they? So worldwide fame and immortality came William's way overnight. He was elected to be a member of the Royal Society and awarded their prestigious Copley Medal. And because he wasn't about flattery we'd heard, uh, and, and self-aggrandizement, um, he named the planet Georgium Sidus, or George's Star, in honor of the king, who of course was George III. But there was a general unwillingness on the part of continental astronomers uh, to call the planet George. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it took some time for a uh, decision to be made that it should be called Uranus. Uranus in Greek mythology is the father of the gods, um, uh, the ruler of the universe, and also some of the Greek things. William's obsession with astronomy became absolute with every aspect of his life coming second to the exploration of the heavens. Caroline sometimes had to feed William as he was working by putting the victuals by bits into his mouth. And sometimes it was so cold that the ink froze in her ink pot. Later on, they worked out a system whereby she was in the house nice and warm, and they put a taut string between the telescope and Caroline, and when William had something to report, he twanged on the skit on the, on the string, and Caroline opened the window and said, what? And he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he turned her don't know what, and she shut the window and went and wrote it down. <laughs> I thought surely he discovered the telephone. <laughs> All right, let's give him that, shall we? Yeah, we'll give him that, shall we? <laughs> there we are, more. That's Voyager uh, on the fly past of Uranus. Wasn't that the time we got married, didn't it? Well, okay. <laughs> That's not Uranus in close up, I'm told. It's a moon of Uranus. 
and those who know about can see see the difference between one lump of um, space rock and another. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> so this is the portrait um, uh, of William, which celebrated the great discovery, and it was. It, it, it um, expanded the universe enormously. After some complex negotiations, the king, oh, there it is. I, was, I put that in just recently. I found it, found it um, uh, <coughs> in a book of astronomy for um, the first set of exams that children take in England for um, uh, leaving school. I thought it was rather nice because I've got a copy of this, the real thing. Um, and it's by a man called Flaxman, who was a very good me medallion maker. And they made many, many of these medallions uh, after William discovered Uranus. And they went out like you buy post postcards of famous people today to um, keep the souvenirs. Now, now we're with George III. Good picture. He was a young man then. After some complex negotiations, the king appointed William to the post of king's astronomer, not astronomer royal. Astronomer royal is a state appointment. The word royal really means state. And um, William left Bath and moved to Slough to be near to the court at Windsor. Slough is quite close to London. And with a stipend of 200 pounds a year, so he'd halved his income, um, which the king paid out of his own pocket, William found himself with only the obligation to sort of entertain the royal family and their guests and show them the heavens through his telescopes whenever he was required to do so. And apart from that, he was going to be free to devote himself entirely to astronomical research. George III is a much maligned monarch. He was actually a very intelligent man, and he had his own observatory at Richmond. He owned a number of Herschel telescopes, and the royal family has got a lot of Herschel's um, original uh, books bound in, the, in their libraries. He joked that he could see clear back to Hanover through one of uh, uh, William Herschel's uh, telescopes. And once, when the Archbishop of Canterbury was brought to, to see um, the planets by the king, um, the king said, Come, my Lord Archbishop, and I will, sh I will show you the way to heaven. <laughs> it's a great pity, really, that George III is remembered for the loss of the American uh, colonies and the, his so-called madness, rather than for his uh, continual encouragement of the sciences and arts. He himself was a good architect. And you have to a pretty disciplined thing to be. He was a steady, intelligent, and decent king, and he had a reign of 63 years, of which only four were um, given over to that awful madness that he had. He covered the years which turned England from an agrarian society to an industrial nation. This is the house which William lived in in Slough. It came to be called Observatory House, and in the family we always call it Ob's House, for short. Mm -hmm. And I lived there until I was three. And it remained in the Herschel family until the 1960s, when it had to be demolished uh, because it was riddled with rot of every kind. And the, and the local council refused to help us out with the cost of restoring it. A great pity, because it could now be the centre for, um, uh, uh, as an early uh, museum of astronomy. And it's close to London, it would have been excellent. I'm not even right about this. Between 1786 and 1789, William designed and had constructed, under his full time supervision, the biggest telescope ever made up to that time. It cost £40,000, and I've just told you how much £400 was worth. So this was a very expensive um, project. And it was contributed, the money came from contributions from all the scientific um, societies and, and, and people's personal pockets. The king himself donated 4,000 pounds to it. So there, there were large sums of money in those days. Okay. 
And this is a picture of the back of the observatory house. And can you see here, going round, to here, like that, that's the base on which the great telescope was placed. It was on um, wheels and rollers, and it was pushed round by sweating workmen while William uh, was taking the observations. Um, and I remember this all very clearly as a child, um, especially that mulberry tree on the side. Um, and this is the cottage in which Caroline used to live here. So that is where the great 40-foot telescope was in relation to the house. And here's one of the uh, part of the tube. It was huge. It was 40 feet long, and it was four, about four feet wide. And when it was dismantled, it was just put against the garden wall of the observatory house. And eventually, parts of it were capped off. But I remember as a little girl running through it and hooping like a little, like a red Indian. It made a wonderful way. <laughs> but the, it it's, um, remains are now at the observatory of Greenwich in the, in the garden there. In its day, it was a tremendous tourist attraction because it was on the main road from London to Bath, and it could be seen for miles because it was so large. The result of that was that um, William suffered the same sort of fate as um, Neil Armstrong and Yuri Gagarin and uh, anybody else you like to think of who's famous in this uh, day and age, because um, visitors came the whole time and just knocked on the door and wanted to be shown it. <laughs> And here is a photo, uh, uh, um, an autograph from John Glenn. I'm quite proud of this because it took me enormous courage to go up to him and say, may I have your autograph? And um, at that time, uh, I was married to David Duncan. And uh, I spoke to John Glenn and asked him why his middle name was Herschel. Did you know that? He's John Herschel Glenn. So I said, why are you Herschel? He said, I don't know. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, can we go back? The image of this incredible telescope lives on in the arms of the um, Royal Astronomical Society. And it's also in the arms of the Herschel family. Museums and libraries all over the world contain volumes of the scores for William's musical compositions. And even we have to pay for them if we want to use them. <laughs> and we use them for my daughter's weddings, which was crowd making. Six pounds a time to hire it. <laughs> and um, there are shelves and shelves of notes uh, on his astronomical discoveries and boxes of things containing his stargazing equipment. And it's not too far-fetched to say today that uh, we benefit from findings which William Herschel originated. For us, in the immediate sense of being on this earth, his most important discovery, I'm glad you're there, <laughs> his most important discovery was infrared and ultraviolet light. And he's discovered this um, because he was using different colored eye shades, different colors of glass in his eye shades as he was doing his observing. And he noticed that different colors of glass gave a different sensation of heat on his skin. And being with him, he wondered why. So he set up an experiment with a plank of wood with holes in it and set it towards the sun and with a prism behind it. And then thermometers placed to catch the different colors of the, from the prism, prism of light. And he noted the different um, uh, temperatures that resulted. And then he saw that there was more heat and coolness on either side. Infrared and ultraviolet is what he called it. And of course, today we're, we're benefiting from it, as I am in this thing. <laughs> Uh, most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. Still haven't got it right. Now, 
During these years, Caroline was busy on her own account, and with William's wholehearted encouragement, um, she was observing the heavens. And as a result, she eventually laid claim to the discovery of no less than eight comets. And she went along to Neville Maskelyne, the Astronomer Royal. Um, she had to go on a horse, 25 mile journey, and it wasn't something she did regularly. She got to his house in London, she knocked on the door, and she said, Dr. Maskelyne, Dr. Maskelyne, I found another planet, and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> And for this work, too, uh, she was uh, um, awarded the Copley Medal. It's the highest honor that astronomers could get at that time, and probably still can get. She was the first woman ever to be so honored, and she became William's assistant, and she was paid money. And this, for her, was just wonderful. It was 50 pounds a year, and it was the first money she'd ever earned, and she was very, very frugal with it. Now, the Herschels through these years have been supplementing their income by the um, making of telescopes. And they had quite a large factory making telescopes. It was um, a status symbol to have a Herschel telescope, and it was a great hobby to be an amateur astronomer. Um, so they've been supplementing their income with, the, uh, with these products. They also acquired property in the area around the surrounding observatory house. And these things together brought them a reasonable income. And guess who did all the admin? Hands up. <laughs> yes, of course, it was Caroline. He couldn't have done without her. He simply could not have done without this tiny little woman. And she was so devoted to him that her life was completely, completely devoid of any emotional in, uh, involvement. So when William announced at the age of just about 50 he was going to get married, the bottom dropped out of Caroline's world. It took several years for her to come to terms with uh, William's marriage, but eventually uh, they, they, um, his wife and she became good friends. Uh, William Herschel's wife was a very nice woman and uh, emotionally intelligent, we call it these days. There she is, and there her, there's her copy medal. I think I've seen one of those people, I'm so sorry. Um, and that's William Herschel's wife, Mary Pitt. She was a widow, um, and uh, she brought um, a good deal of money to William because she'd been left wealthy by her father's death and even wealthier from her husband's death. Um, and so um, after this marriage, they were very comfortably off, I mean, seriously comfortably off. She's not a very pretty woman in this picture, is she? But those strong looks have gone down the family from the time she came into it until now. Right, here's a list of um, some of the people for whom uh, William was making telescopes. You can see in the first one, which went to the King of Spain, he sold it for, what is it, 3,150 pounds? Mm -hmm. It's getting on to a million pounds today. So he wasn't doing badly. Sorry? I was adjoined to Francis Drake, so Francis Drake was on the list. <laughs> really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fifth one down. Fifth one down. Fifth one down. Wow. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Yes, sir. It is. I haven't noticed that. Oh. Yeah. 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 I think that's a bit out of kilter, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I met a Francis Drake the other day. He's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been old. So from this time on, uh, William was able to take things a bit more easily. And he and Mary traveled all over the country, and they went to the factories that were producing the new, um, new goods, which were powering the um, Industrial Revolution. In 1802, I think let's get this. Yes. Oh, look. I'm right out of kilter on my pictures and my script. Do forgive me. Don't want him yet. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Here we go. Is this the right one? That'll do. Um, lots, <laughs> lots and lots of um, things have been named after William. Um, all over the place. I'm very surprised they turn up the whole time. Um, on the left, down in Antarctica, is that lovely mountain 
of that sharp, sharp um, peak on it, uh, named after him. And in front is Edmund Hillary. Do you know what he did? Yeah. First man to climb Everest, or the second. Um, and then this is the um, uh, dome of the telescope, na of, of the telescope named after William in um, the Canary Islands, and that's the telescope itself. Um, in Slough, there's a grammar school, and um, above Canada, there's an island, and there's a good news, everybody, there's a pub. <laughs> <laughs> And also a shopping centre, and there's a, there's a lunar sea after William, and another one after Caroline, and another one after John. And what else was there? That is it. But it, I'm surprised. There's also a Herschel Street in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter walks regularly down Herschel Street in Cambridge, parks her car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Love that free space. Yeah. <laughs> so, William married Mary Pitt, and the bottom dropped out of Caroline's world. I was catch up with myself. I'm sorry, I'm out of kilter. Um, could we get back to that portrait of um, Napoleon? He should be that is. Yeah, that's it. Um, in 1802, uh, after the Treaty of Amiens, um, Europe was much more stable politically, and William and Mary were able to go off to Europe and have a holiday, and they went to Paris and they met Napoleon. And the, <laughs> the ensuing conversation was about astronomy for a short while, but Napoleon couldn't cope with that. Uh, he asked one or two simple questions and then backed out and started talking about the breeding of horses. And at that point, William was out of his depth. So. <laughs> um, but he did meet Napoleon. I put that very grand portrait of Napoleon in because of, he was an overweeningly vain man. The only way to summarize William Herschel's work and the vast extent of his observational researches is to say that he was the founder of stellar astronomy. Apart from uh, the discovery of Uranus, he surveyed and catalogued, with Aunt Caroline's unstinting help, the whole of the northern skies, and in the process, he discovered no less than two and a half thousand nebulae. He gave astronomy a metrical picture of our own galaxy. He was the first person to realize that we were in a galaxy, in a galaxy shape, and that he, he suggested that there were thousands of others outside our own galaxy, which I think was a leap of imagination, uh, quite extraordinary. Um, 